How the Light Gets In is the Institute of Art and Ideas' unique festival, combining days full of talks and debates in philosophy, politics, arts and science, with evenings full of music and dance. Get your tickets for the world's largest music and philosophy festival at howthelightgetsin.org. We're in a situation today which is very, very unusual in the history of civilization. A survey last year showed that the majority of people in Britain say they have no religion. There have been very, very few civilizations where most people have had no religion. It happened in the Soviet Union and in the communist countries where religion was forcibly suppressed. Um, but it's not because it's been forcibly suppressed here. Uh, and the percentage of people who actually go to church on a regular basis is now in Britain about 5%. It's similar in France, in Sweden. Uh, in some countries in Europe it's a bit higher, 12% in some, but it's very, very low. Uh, most of Europe is now uh, described by many people as post-Christian. So, does this mean that most people have become atheists? Well, the answer is no. The surveys also show that the percentage of atheists in the population is about 13% here in Britain. So, together with the number of people who are regularly religious, um, uh, and atheists, they're less than 20%. So 80% of people are neither identifying as religious nor as atheists. And it, what happens in the for most people, the interest in spirituality hasn't gone away. In fact, there's probably more interest in spirituality now than ever before, in terms of actual practices by which one can experience uh, spiritual realities. And by spiritual realities, I mean uh, a sense of connection with a consciousness greater than our own. Now for some people that sense of connection is just a trick played by the brain, something going on inside the head, but for most people it's the feeling that our consciousness is indeed part of some greater consciousness or can connect with it, or greater consciousnesses, because there may be many. At the same time, uh, there's also been in the last 25 years a lot of investigations scientifically of spiritual practices. Some of these are of brain scans and physiology. Uh, some of them are social science studies of the effects of spiritual practices. Um, in 2001, uh, an enormous volume called The Handbook of Religion and Health came out, reviewing about 1,500 papers in peer-reviewed journals about religious and spiritual practices. And in 2012, volume two, uh, reviewed a further uh, nearly 2,000 papers. Um, uh, and these are huge volumes and there's a huge amount of research. About 4% of these papers found that religious practices could make people feel worse and these were uh, for people who lived in a state of religious conflict or who felt incredibly guilty and belonged to religions that made them feel even guiltier. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the great majority of these studies showed beneficial effects. Uh, basically, they showed that people who have religious and spiritual practices are happier, healthier, and live longer. Uh, the effects on lifespan were quite dramatic, and as some people have said, if any pill were discovered that had these effects, it would be hailed as a wonder drug. These findings have not been lost on atheists. Uh, the atheist writer and philosopher Alain de Botton brought out a book three or four years ago called Religion for Atheists. And what de Botton says in that book is that he himself was raised atheist. His parents were Jewish, living in Switzerland, and were fanatically uh, uh, atheistic. He said that if anyone showed the slightest interest in religion, his parents treated them as if they were suffering from some terminal degenerative disease <laughs> and never took them seriously thereafter. And so he said he was raised atheist, he accepts his parental faith, um, but he's not interested in fighting religion, but in atheism 2.0. What happens when you've given up religion? You no longer gather in a sacred place. You no longer have uh, sing together with members of your community. You no longer celebrate festivals. You miss out on rites of passage. You no longer go on pilgrimages. You no longer hear sermons, which are talks designed to help you lead a better life. Um, and you no longer have love feasts or agapes. You no longer have temples. Well, he's planning to build an atheist temple in London. Um, he inherited 200 million pounds, so <laughs> that makes it easier. Um, and he's um, started a series of atheist sermons on Sunday mornings in London. Um, 
also trying out atheist love feasts. Meanwhile, um, other uh, prominent atheists, including Susan Blackmore, who's at this festival, um, are meditators. Uh, she's been doing Zen meditation for years. And Sam Harris, who's one of the so-called new atheists in America, is now giving online meditation courses uh, because uh, it helps people. It's a serious help in people's lives. Also, uh, two or three years ago, a group of people in England founded an atheist church called the Sunday Assembly. It now has more than 70 branches. They meet on Sunday mornings, sing happy songs, tell uplifting stories. And in fact, they've rebranded it. They don't want to be called an atheist church anymore. They prefer it to be called mystical humanism. So religions are being reinvented right now. Um, and spiritual practices are receiving a great deal of scientific attention. In my book, Science and Spiritual Practices, I discuss seven. There are many different practices, but uh, I only discuss seven. Um, uh, gratitude, um, meditation, been a great deal of research on meditation now. Uh, singing and chanting. This is something I've learned a lot about from my wife, Jill Purse, who gives wonderful singing and chanting workshops. And one other thing I learned from Jill, which is an inspiration for this book, is that uh, the people who come to her workshops, some are non-religious, some are religious, it doesn't matter. You can do these practices whatever your belief system. Um, it's about experience, not about signing up to a belief. And uh, Jill's uh, workshops take one to the very heart of the effect of the voice on the body, the vibrations it sets up in the body, the effects of chanting with other people, where you come into resonance with a whole group of people, literal resonance. Um, so that's uh, another practice I discuss. Um, connecting with nature, uh, relating to plants, which is a favorite one of mine. It's a kind of spillover from connecting in with nature. It wouldn't all fit in one chapter. Uh, pilgrimage is one of the uh, really important uh, practices that I'm talking about, and I'll say more about that now, and rituals. So these are practices found in all religious traditions and which can be experienced outside them as well. And we now, in Britain, have access to the whole of the world's religious traditions and spiritual traditions. Three or four hundred years ago, no one would have heard of the shamanic use of ayahuasca in South America, or shamanic drumming in uh, Native American tribes, or Buddhist meditation, or Zen and, and Tibetan Buddhist practices. Um, all these things were unknown, so was most about Hinduism, and people were aware of Islam, but not much more, and Judaism, but not much more. We're in a situation where you can do any of these practices. There are teachers and people from all these traditions living here in Britain. So, it's a new situation. I'm going to talk, uh, I don't have time to talk about them all, but I'm going to talk about uh, a few of these practices, and I'll start with gratitude. This is, in a way, the simplest. Gratitude has now been studied by positive psychologists, and uh, some of you are probably aware of the positive psychology movement. Uh, it's been going for, what, 20 or 30 years. Um, and this is a movement among psychologists who are trying to find out what makes people happy. What makes it a radical departure from traditional psychology is that most of it was about what makes people miserable. Because psychotherapists, after all, mostly see people who are miserable. Um, and so there's a lot of studies on what makes people miserable. But uh, the positive psychology movement set out to find out why are pe what makes people happy. They started with a series of studies in which people had beepers which went off at random times and they had to write down what they were doing and what, how happy they felt on a one to nine scale. Um, and it turned out that people um, throughout the day, their level of happiness varied of course, but the activities they were involved in when they were happy were very varied. Sometimes when they were really absorbed in their work, sometimes when they're having a great conversation, sometimes when they're making love, sometimes when they're dancing or singing, uh, sometimes when they're playing games. Um, the common thing with all these th was that they were in a state of flow, and that's what made them feel happy. Uh, what made them feel unhappy was boredom, disconnection, separation, isolation, uh, disconnection from what's happening.
your tickets for the world's largest music and philosophy festival at howthelightgetsin.org.